Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, as always, thanks so much. Hope everybody's enjoying uh, their final week of summer. Not that anything feel <laughs> feels any different, I don't feel like. Um, so uh, thanks to uh, Phil for moderating. Everybody's here, people are jumping in. Thanks so much, looking forward to talking here. Um, oh, I think I forgot to get a a code for true fire but if you wait a little bit i have a uh, 25 percent of all my courses i think expired august the end of august so i'll get that redone i've been kind of busy so i forgot to do that um so i'll do that uh all right so to hope everybody's well today i want to talk about uh, a bunch of things um open strings in a blues so i just stayed on an e minor e e swampy thing so first thing, um, I have a little tremolo on there and a little delay, because it sounds cool, right? 
Okay, so yeah. Okay, so the first thing we want to think about, E minor pentatonic. E minor blues. Right, so I'm going to have uh, my e minor, e minor pentatonic scale in the open position. E, G, A, B flat, B, D, E, G, A, B flat. There's my B, E, and G. So we have all those notes that are available to us. We have, if you look inside your E minor pentatonic scale, lo and behold, we have an E minor chord, which is E, G, and B. So I'm kind of... I'm, I'm flirting between E minor and not quite E7. Right, if I did that. Much happier sounding. I'm kind of going for more of that Lightning Hopkins. That kind of a sound. Now, um, one big thing is we have these top two strings. So if you notice, I'm, I'm kind of skirting away from my third a bit. Um, what I mean by that is if I, if I really hit the third really hard, it makes it sound really major. If I hit it really hard on the, the, the G, which is the flat, a, a flat three, it makes everything really dark. So what I want to do is kind of tweak that third. So let's work on that first one. I have my low E, and I'm going to play this G. Just bend it a little bit. The trick on this kind of a bend is to not, excuse me, is to not stop the bend. You always want to keep that bend in motion. part of the sound. In, in fact, it's, it is the sound, so you really want to work on that. And I'm using my low E as sort of the drone so I can play against that. Now, um, some points I was hybrid picking or using my fingers or just my pick, um, or just my fingers. So when I use just my fingers, I'm putting my pick between my first and second finger like this, and then I can grab it when I need it. So there... keeping those chord notes and one two three so by just kind of nailing that G and then we have this D bend that a little bit the flat seven we're kind of bending that up and then we're gonna play the E that's a great sense so let's work on that so I'm gonna play this chord of notes on the bottom which is tricky Kind of like baby, please don't go. Right, that kind of sound. Right, that kind of thing. Right, so um, this sound is really important to the whole, the whole thing. So we have this open B string, and that doesn't have the third either, so we can really play off of this. Right? So that's a great kind of thing to just feel that. So, um, yeah, it makes that sound like that Viagra commercial. They took Smokestack Lightning and ruined Smokestack Lightning for a Viagra commercial. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. So every time I play, I'm thinking of a, I hear Cialis or whatever the hell it is, Viagra. Okay, so, so here's a cool lick, guys. Check it out. I'm going to slide up from the D to the E and then hit my open E string. So I've got that...
notes and really letting those play off of each other. So, the next sort of really valuable position, you know, they wish you were here. That whole move. So it's fingering number one of E minor pentatonic with the opening strings. And we're going to move up and we're going to get the, we, the upper part of it. So it's fingering number two, A, G, E, D, B. I'm going to slide back down. So we have this cool move of, right? That kind of move. Now, we have all of our open strings that we can throw in there. So that move, let's check this guy. Right, that move, so I'm going to play, I'm going to slide it from A to B to D and then have my open E. So let them all ring out on top of each other. Right? Check that out. So I'm moving the same kind of ideas and then using my open strings. Right near from Hey Joe. So the same exact move. And um, I'm always resolving back to sort of an E. And I'm not sitting on the G on its own too long without tweaking it. So, and then I'm just always going back down to these blues, open E minor blues scale, and then I'll throw in sometimes that blue note. That's that kind of sound. Now, I played those higher strings with my fingers, so. Because right, you can get that, instead of going, which sounds good, but. It's nice and easy to grab with the fingers. <laughs> right, so you can really have a ton of fun. It's really hard to do anything wrong with it because all the notes are in E minor pentatonic and your ear is going to carry you back down quite a bit. Okay, so. Um, now I did this move there huge one in the blues. I'm going to play this G, and I have my B, and I'm going to bend that up, and then go to my open E and B string. So that move, it's a great lead lick too. You know. If I played it better. That kind of sound. So there again, we're taking the E minor pentatonic. 
and we're bending that G to get that. So that's that part of that sound. Now, um, one trick that I learned, um, I got really into the older stuff like John Lee Hooker, and I still love that stuff. Um, when they hear that kind of like, um, it never quite sounded right to me with a down pick. So what I discovered was that if you watch John Lee Hooker who played with his fingers, he did this on an up pick. It sounds so much different. Let's Same with like a, you know, the whole kind of Sweet Home Chicago or that, you know. Or like that. By doing it with your middle finger like this, which can really kind of hurt if you're not careful in terms of the uh, <laughs> calluses. I'm already kind of feeling I haven't done this in a while. But... It really sounds really different. They're going like, like dust my broom. Right. That. It's just the way the finger rakes across those top three strings that makes it sound so much more uh, legit and cool. So, um, and the other one we can get that's really cool, and it's a real light in Hopkins one, is the B and the D. So E minor 7 is spelled E, G, B, and D, and we're going to play the B and the D. When I played that major third, it's like, that doesn't sound quite right based upon what I played previously. So I might not hit that third. I might just go up to the. So it's definitely a different sound. So um, a lot of these licks down here. usually better today but all those kind of licks right there you can kind of work out some patterns just by playing you know uh, you kind of those standard kind of patterns but you could do that over the E minor open position You know, kind of work through some of those ideas, and they work through. Obviously, like something like Scuttle Button, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan, it's all based upon this open E minor. That's pretty tricky. Um, uh, World Keep It Turning uh, off of, is a Fleetwood Mac tune. Yeah. It's kind of like, it sounds like Life on the Drop, it's Steve Ray Vaughan, you hear that kind of sound too. So, um, we hear that quite a bit. Now, one last thing, and I can just get some questions as we go through this, is, well, we have this G, open G string. How do we make it sound cool? How can we tweak that sound of sound, that sort of sound? So it's gotta be this. Mind me, you know. Tweaking that flat third, so on E, we just bring it up towards the ceiling. I have E, E, and then my G. So getting that. My little 
light fell down. Hold on. I gotta get this better. I rolled my chair on it and my little backlight fell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right? It's really cool stuff. So I'm just thinking E minor pentatonic, blue scale, open strings. Right? And then I've got this tweak third. And then up here, we've got that. Up here. That's all there is to it. And a lot of practice. But listen to the right people. One of the guys I learned a ton of this stuff from was Lightning Hopkins. So if you want to check out somebody, I'm a big fan of his stuff. Um, John Lee Hooker, of course. Um, but for me, of open E sort of things, it's, it's Light and Hopkins. And he gets all into all his great grooves. I if I can still do this. Like. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't done a while on that stuff, but that's... That's all Lightning Hopkins, man. Oh, one last little lick I wanted to show you. Um, you know, what, in one of my earlier turnarounds, I did this. And one thing I learned from Skip James, who's a, an adult blues guitar player, who actually tuned to open E minor. He tuned to open E minor. And a cool little lick that he would do, actually tuned to open D minor, but... minor so it's almost like you're waiting for that but he goes and ends it on the minor which is really hip that's kind of fun to throw in there so he does a tune it's like his version of it's, um, killing floor blues there's a lot of these titles that are the same um, it's not killing floor, but there's, oof, devil got my woman. He does like a. like that. Really cool. That's that intro that does. Makes it minor. Okay. So, E minor pentatonic, Leighton Hopkins, a lot of the Delta guys will do this. Certainly, Stu Ray Vaughan, you're going to hear him do all this. Hendrix, Voodoo Child, um, both one and two. Uh, man, any Hendrix blues in E is going to have all this stuff. <laughs> Cool. Uh, any any questions? I'm looking for some questions. Let me take a drink on camera. Can you hear that? Me drinking? All right. So let's say hi to everyone who is here. Phil, of course. Uh, J Jason Carter, thanks for being here. Um, Steven Sansett, Tim, sorry, uh, Tom Minette. Hey, man, what's up, guys? S.E. Nesbitt, Grandpa Bob. All the guys, Graham Ross, uh, Brogue, 
Uh, Matt Gibson, what's up? Hey, Bill Spruce, what's going on? So Angus Clark in here earlier. Richard and Sarah, what's up? All the guys, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, okay. So, questions. All right. Well, I'll talk a little bit myself then <laughs> about stuff. Um, one of the, the big things about this is just keeping that thumb going. Laying that down. Right? But it still comes back to this. Two, three, four, and one. Two, three. Whatever the tempo is. Now, sometimes when I'm getting really into it, I might drop that thumb a bit, you know, because I don't have it perfect. But I might have it like 90% of the time, hopefully, or 85% of the time. That's all that really matters, you know. Um. All right, so I see some of the questions about the guitar. Yeah, it's a new PRS. Um, they uh, been really cool. And this is a fi uh, 594 McCarty. And uh, I said to put it's not a 10 top. It's just one of their regular uh, off-the-shelf ones, which is still pretty freaking spectacular. And, um, you know, it's a Gibson scale as opposed to the Grissom, which is 25-inch. Uh, and this is uh, 1 and 5 94ths, which, uh, according to... Paul was the the length of his favorite neck on a, the neck of his on his favorite uh, Les Paul of the fifty like a fifty nine Les Paul with this scale length, so we put it on. Um, it's got a bit of a wider neck than it does in the Grissom guitar, and it's a bit fatter, so it's um, a bit more like uh, um, my Les Paul. Actually, quite a bit more like my Les Paul. But what's fun about it, as you know, we all know with the, I mean, the playability, it stays in tune. Um, it's easier to sit down with, for sure. And it just sounds great. A little bit lower output pickups than uh, the Grissom. Sounds good with more gain, yeah? Next position. I can split that, which is kind of cool. So it's a, it's a pretty great guitar, I gotta say. Um, really, really digging it. Um, great job. I can split all the, pick, the pickups, the bridge too. You know, it's pretty... I mean, whenever you split a, a humbucker, it never sounds exactly like a strat for many, many reasons. One, it's not a true single coil. You're just splitting it. Um, and the scale length and all that. But, I mean, I'm just really digging this guitar a lot. And it's beautiful. And uh, sounds amazing. I'm kind of blown away. And it's funny, I've been talking to Kirk Fletcher, who's a, a friend of mine. And Kirk has been playing these. And he and I have been back and forth about, like, how's yours? I'm like, it's amazing. And he's like, how's yours? It's amazing, you know? Um... So we're both really into it. So people have asked me, do I like this or the DGT better? Man, I don't know. They're both great. And they're both different. And that's what's, what I really love about it. The DGT is a little more rocking. You know, and this feels a little bit more traditional. Even though it doesn't look it, it feels it. It's much closer to, uh, to my Les Paul in terms of feel and sound. Um, but um, but the, uh, the Grissom is a little... Uh, little Probably because of the pickups, probably a little thicker and meatier, and um, the the uh, 
the Grissom can get a bit more stratty, which would make perfect sense because it's got a longer scale length. And all these things are really important. And since I love playing Les Paul so much, um, and hate traveling with Les Pauls, not that anybody's traveling. Um, this is uh, this has really been, this is really cool. I'm really really psyched about the sound of this guitar. The construction is what you would expect. So I'm really blown away. You know, I, I, honestly, like I was never really seeing myself as a PRS guy because the first earlier ones that I had tried were like the custom 22s and 24s, which are great, but they weren't my thing. I like a more of a vintage style guitar. So um, pretty surprising, you know. Uh, how, how, not surprising how good they are, surprising that how much I really like, I'm surprised at how much I really like it. And I mean that because I never really played any of these. I had only played the, uh, the more shreddery ones. And now this is just, this feels like a Les Paul to me. <laughs> and it sounds like one. So the real joy on this, as opposed to, you know, it's the, the stuff that they took care of, you know, like the string tree, go, the strings go straight across the nut as opposed to off to the side. So the tuning is, um, is, uh, is better, you know. Um, but, you know, if you said uh, of, of these two at this moment, like if I had to grab one or the other, it would probably be the DGT because I like the tremolo um, and certain appointments that David put on it that I really love. Like uh, the pickups are lower down. It feels more like a Strat over here. This feels a little bit more like a Gibson over here. Little things, but, but they do sound different and they're both freaking awesome. And, uh, hey, yeah, John Horn, right? It is really amazing what the scale length does. I'm just, I know that, you know that, you know, but, you know, when you play a Les Paul and you play a Strat, it's like a Les Paul or a Strat, and you're expecting it to just be different and feel different. But when you play a guitar with two humbuckers, two humbucker guitars with different scale length, it's, it, you hear that. Like, this just sounds more like a Les Paul because it's a smaller scale length. The, uh, the Grissom doesn't sound as much like a Les Paul. I mean, it sounds great. It doesn't sound like a... It's not unfamiliar. It's not some sort of weird sounding guitar. It just uh, falls in between there a little bit, which is great. Um, well, if you want, I, which shall I compare them? You want to hear the two? Okay, there's the... Uh, now, I don't know uh, how old the strings are in the TGT, but let's check it out. Nerd fest. This one looks great on camera too. All right, so uh, here. And then the neck, it's a little more stratty. Right? Sorry, little. <laughs> yeah, so it's brighter. Um, so a little more stratty, like more, yep, more twang, a little bright. Also, you know, you got the, the trim, which is going to make a huge difference a fixed bridge versus a tremolo. Um, so they're, what I love is they're both awesome you know they both serve different purposes so uh this is much the 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 black one is much more or less polished sounding right you know more gamey Right, so very different, uh, which is cool because I don't want the two of them to sound the same. It's great. So let's pick this one back up. Oops. It's all right. There we go. There's that thing again. I got to fix the way to make this stay up. My chair keeps on hitting this thing. I'm trying to be all cool and having that show up, but hey, it's live. Definitely lower output pickups. Which isn't a bad thing at all, you know? So, um, there it is. I'm not even bother with that thing anymore again. All right. <laughs> all right, so. Um, 
How about the DGT pickups in the McCarty? You know, I'd experiment around with it. Um, so far, I just want to live with this because I, I have the DGT. And the way that sounds is awesome. And then I'm really digging this. See? That just sounds great, too. It's a lot not as, uh, as gainy. Now, um... Let me get some, some questions, maybe. Um, okay. Um, can you use the B-flat and some riffs here? Um, you mean, um, this is from Clive. Uh, oh, like the, the blue note. Yeah, so... So this kind of thing. Hear the difference between the two? They both sound awesome. That's a cool lick. So kind of pull off from the B flat to the A to low G. Back up to the E. That's the kind of move to get together. And then the B, the B, the B flat. Like All right, so you can bend it. All right, so yeah, definitely the B flat in there for sure, the blue note. Um, any practice tips on finger picking this? Um, <coughs> this is from James Spezano. Excuse me, I keep on getting that wrong. Um, practice <laughs> right so um i put the pick i usually like putting the pick here like i said between my first finger and middle finger because i just find it's easier to play i'm not doing any intricate finger picking if i'm gonna do you know something you know which i can't do like a bach thing yeah which we haven't played in years i'm out of tune um I will definitely put a pick down. I can't play that stuff with a pick in my hand. But if I'm playing rock and blues, I'll put that pick to my first and second finger so I can grab it when I need it. I turn on the air conditioner, so all things. And one thing about these necks, man, and these guitars are completely sturdy. It's crazy. Well, my... I mean, so my Tuttles, but, you know, sometimes... I had an old Gibson years, not an old, I had a Gibson years ago. And the neck would move, it would get humid out, and I'm like, Ugh. so. Frustrating. So what I would do is put the pick between first finger and the second finger, and it's work on a lick. And I'll use my ring finger too. I never really use my pinky, because it's just, it, you know, it's too short. So, I mean, a lick to check out, man, is like that Rolling Stone lick, Muddy Rodders. I do it in one of my lockdowns. Lose by yourself. So you want to check back, you can see it. And to add some more positive light, we're going to change the title to the Brooklyn Broadcast. I think I'm digging that. Brooklyn Broadcast. All right. Um, oh, Richard and Star, uh, what three songs every guitar player should have in their back pocket? Oof. Well, it depends on the kind of music um, and, the, and the gag. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would always think I would want to know three. Uh, I can't answer that. That's so many songs. Let's pop it into my head. Um, if you're just like a bar band gig, you got to know like Honky Tonk Woman. Everybody loves that one. It's showing my age. Who knows what people want now? They might want to hear a Fuel song from the 90s. I don't know. Blues tunes that you should know that are really cool to dig out is, uh, you got to know Stormy Monday, though I hate when people call it, but you got to know it. Um, you definitely want to know Thrill is Gone. That comes up quite a bit. Um... 
You know, one of the uptown groove kind of riffs, like uh, Tore Down, I would say something like that. That's a hugely, you know, huge question. All right. Um, just looking through. Brooklyn Broadcast it is. Done. Are you ready? Okay, Angus is, Angus is answering <laughs> songs you must know. Um, are you ready to rock? Three songs. Uh, yep, by, by uh, Michael Schenker Group. Tonight I'm going to rock you tonight. <laughs> All right. Um, All right, you may have missed the beginning, but all these ideas are basically over an E chord. Yeah. Yeah, man, like, it's just over an E vamp. Like, you know. Of course you could go the full. So one tune that really was a big one for me, too, is um, Brown Sugar off of ZZ Top's first record. That kind of... I left out the... My friends went told me... Yeah, watch, check that out. Yeah. Um, any bottleneck blues riffs? Uh, maybe in another day. Uh, when I play slide, it's almost always in, in open tuning. I'm an okay slide player. I played a lot of Delta stuff, you know, on my national, but, you know, when guys like Derek Trus Trucks exist and Sonny Landreth and Joey Landreth and, and uh, Ariel, I, 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 I just play it when I need to because <laughs> I just don't have it at that level. I'm a much better regular guitar player. I can play some stuff, like some Dwayne Allman stuff that I've learned, but no, uh, not so much. Okay, so we're talking about songs you must know. Yeah, there's a whole list. Now, one thing that I want to talk about today, too, is I am playing through my Turok Bloomfield Drive now into the Ox, which is sitting perilously on its side because my other shorter, longer cable croaked. So this is the actual the Bloomfield Drive, which is my uh, favorite amp. <laughs> Now the ox works, it works kind of strangely, like it sounds great, but it gets uh, much much cleaner through a regular speaker. Like this is a clean channel kind of cranked, but has more more headroom to it when I'm not playing through this. It's, you know, it's not real. It's very good, but it ain't real, you know what I mean? So, my new cable is actually in the mail. It's supposed to be delivered anytime today by Amazon. My uh, Spitif uh, optical cable. So I've got my pedal board, which, which we could run through in another day. That'd be kind of fun. My Univibe, which is actually set. That's a vibrato. You know, I can talk about this stuff in the leather. That'd be fun. Yeah. All right, we can talk about that another day. Um, all right. So, yeah, uh, I think I had forgotten uh, to update the 25% off on all my courses, but I do want to uh, thank all you guys for supporting me on the courses, and I see some people have hit the tip jar, and I really appreciate that, guys. It, it really helps quite a bit, um, and it allows me to keep on doing this. Um, got some cool stuff coming up that I 
uh, on other people's YouTube channels that I will be doing. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that when that starts. I'll keep you guys all uh, informed. Have you ever tried a wireless system on your guitar? Yeah. Uh, when I was playing, when I was touring, um, sometimes I would use one, and they're really uh, not not for me. I don't play big enough gigs to use them, but I found that they were sort of different in tone a little bit, or the way they reacted when you roll back the volume, or if you like to use overdrive. They can be a little weird. The new ones are much better than they used to be. Um, maybe Angus, if he's still online, can chime in. He plays with Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and, uh, you know, he's obviously going wireless because he's running around arenas and stadiums, literally in the, through the audience. So he would give a better review on, on, on wireless units. But for me... A few things. One, that's another thing that can go wrong, and it's they don't want to be like Spinal Tap where you're picking up the radio, which has happened at when I have used it, and um, they can sound a bit weird because it's about it's about the uh, output and getting the, um, the the Z's right. You know what I mean? Like the the uh, what was the word I'm looking for? The cap not capacitance, but like for for instance, some of them have a buffer in them because they need to. And then if you put that before a fuzz, it doesn't quite work right. Blah, 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 blah. So um, I find a cable easier. And most of the gigs I play at, I, I don't need a wireless. You know, I'm, I'm about usually about five tops, ten feet away from my amp anyway. So, no, I don't really use them that much. Um, okay. Um, oh, yeah, I was saying I have a new code. Uh, co code. New course that um, uh, Angus chimed in. Necessary evil on the wireless yeah so you're right angus we've talked about this they, they don't feel the same as a as a real cable into an amp you, you definitely got to get something different but you know if you're angus young but someone like angus young it's a part of his sound he's using that uh, schaefer wireless that um solidalis or Solod Solidalis, uh does a nice replica of solidalis replica schaefer replica and it helps get that sound so i think that that's really great um for his particular thing. But I uh, know in terms of me, no, I wouldn't use it. So obviously, Angus too, he's got a lot more experience with it. Uh, Ron Pierce, I'm not helping. The next you were going to buy McCarty, um, then you're leaning towards it. <laughs> you're leaning towards the Grissom, and now you're leaning toward this, the 594, then the, Giss the Grissom. I don't know, man. They're both really great. I would say, here's here's my, my take on it. And this is what, uh, uh, for me, being a still at my heart a Strat guy, as much as I love this, and I really do love this, I feel like the uh, the, the Grissom is is really really versatile. Like it sounds a bit Stratty, and this is why David put it together. And you got the splits that really sound good, and they're noise free. And you got the tremolo. So for me, that guitar, I just took to it immediately, and it was something of its own. But I took to it right away. I just, it's such a great guitar. And um, I know Tom and would agree, and a few other guys. But it's um, it's it's a great it's a great guitar. I really enjoy playing it, uh, and uh, thoroughly intend to. You know, live I could see just bringing that with you because it feels like I like I, said, I can get kind of stratty on it. Um, David had them put the 6100 frets in it, which I really love on that guitar. These are about 6105s, which I like too. These are pretty, still pretty tall. I like a little taller fret, but. Plenty tall. I want to A-B this to my Les Paul. Um, uh, they're very similar. Now, uh, thanks, Phil. Phil, at which course covers triads? Well, I don't have a course that specifically covers triads in a technical way, like here's how you play all your triads. I'm going to put one of those together, but m my courses, any of my core tone soloing courses are playing the changes. Uh, those are really triad based and here's the reason why I didn't call them triads is because uh, they don't sell as well I'm gonna be honest people are like chord tone soloing cool and you pick it up you're like oh he's getting me to learn triads but if I put out a course saying Jeff Macarlin triads you might be like snore so I found with my students and many people making people realize they need to learn their triads and they go oh what are you playing there? I'm like, triads. But you call the chord tone soloing. Yeah, triads. So everything is triads. So the chord tone soloing, playing the changes uh, are one. But I don't have a specific course that shows you about the triads. I'm sure there's one on True Fire that is quite good, you know. 
Um, but it is a good idea to put one of those out. But it was really literally a, uh, uh, it was a marketing decision. We talked about it. Did you just talk about the colorless triads? Or like, and I thought that the idea of the chord tone soloing thing is more, a little more exciting. Okay. Um, all right, let's see what else we got. Um, all right. And Ron, you're back to the DGT. Yeah. Um, the DGT is great. And, you know, David, you know, David and I were talking about it, and, he, you know, a lot of times he would bring that on sessions, and people would want him to have a Les Paul. And um, they'd always kind of end up coming back to the DGT because it just intonates so well, and it's so clear, and all those kind of things. All right, so... Um, Uh, all right. Any other questions? All right. So, once again, yeah, yeah. Contact Phil. Phil is always so nice. He's written out the triads in each key. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. So, contact Phil right now, and he will send you that. And thanks to Phil for for the community he's helped build here, and and sending in all this stuff to everybody. Okay. So, oh, it's talking about a new course. That's out in True Fire Uptown Blues, where I'm talking about playing over some more advanced chord changes. Almost primarily, not primarily, largely the 16251 chord progression. So um, I'd love for you guys to check that one out. And yes, that is Evil Knievel. Um, I had all the toys when I was a kid. So I thought I'd throw that back in there. It was actually, I, I had lost all of them. My brother found it for me at a, uh, like a flea market or something like that at one point. <laughs> Um, do you play an acoustic, and what do you have back there? Um, I, I don't play acoustic that much. I mean, I have an old national, you know, a, a real old one, um, like a real old national. I, love, I play a lot of Delta Blues stuff. Um, I have a Martin. Uh, it's, I can't say it's not a great one, because they're all pretty good, but it's, it's an okay Martin. I don't have a great acoustic, and, and I'll tell you a bunch of reasons why. Um, Really great ones are really expensive, and I've, I've just kind of made a decision at some point that most of my work is on the electric guitar, and I just play better on the electric. And I, I love playing acoustic, especially when you play a nice one. It's really, really good. Also, <laughs> this may sound totally ridiculous, and anybody who lives in the, the northeast or in a cold-slash-hot climate can really, uh, can really uh, understand. Keeping... A nice acoustic humidified is so difficult for me because in New York we have a lot of forced heat. There's no humid, you know, keeping the room at, at temperature where my guitar doesn't crack. So my Martin has two big, huge cracks across the top. I had another cheaper acoustic before that one and that cracked too. And I had the thing in the case and I just wouldn't stay on it enough. Mm -hmm. So I kind of honestly was like, I don't have enough call for a really nice acoustic. And, you know, I know they have the humid packs. Uh, hey, Glenn, what's up, man? Um, yeah, they, but I just always forget to put them in. You know, I like to really have a guitar out so I can just pick it up, you know. And you, yeah, you can't. Um, Sun lives in, in Denver. You know, it's also the same thing. I was, you know, I went on vacation once to uh, Belize. No, co it was Costa Rica, whatever. Um, Super humid, and I just brought a little travel acoustic. <laughs> Within days, the top had literally warped like this, you know. And so, it, uh, that it it went back to shape. But um, yeah, I can't. Af I'm not going to build a room to store my guitars in. And so I gave up on the really nice acoustics. And that's strictly the answer because uh, a really nice one is really expensive, and and I just uh, I just can't keep them keep them right. If that makes sense. Okay. Um, I, Graham, you jumped that toy off for everything. Oh man, me too, man. Uh, we're talking about the evil Knievel toys. <laughs> yeah, when you, you wind them up and let them shoot out. I had all that. The Snake Canyon. I had that. I had um, the Chopper. I had the evil Knievel Camper. I think it was a camper he had, you know. Oh man, they were the best toys ever. My friends and I would create the ramps and yeah, ride them off for everything. Awesome toys. Um, okay, cool. 
Well, I appreciate everybody being here today. Um, I'll update that. Hey, Bill. Bill Shikaitis, what's up, man? How's it going? Um, I'll update uh, the, the course sale thing, but um, yeah, if you want, go through my website, jeffmackerlane.com. All my courses over there for True Fire. If you haven't picked up the new one, I would really love if you did. I think you'd dig it. And it's a great way to support me, and I appreciate that. And how I make my living. Uh, like I said, I've got some cool stuff coming up. I'm finishing up a course with the uh, wonderful and awesome dude, Brett Papa. I'm be putting out a course with Brett. Um, some more rock stuff. I'm going to cover a few of my favorite guitar players in a general sense, like what I learned from Eric Clapton, what I've learned from Jeff Beck, what I learned from... Oh, the new code works on my website just fine. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Great. I guess I, I asked them to extend it. I didn't know they had done it yet. Um, and... Uh, working on that and a few other things lined up. Now, I'm always open to suggestions from you guys, you know, um, what you would like to see from me. Uh, I had to get a few things done. I just finished up another True Fire course, that one of the first home-produced courses that they're doing, and that's going to be on the pentatonic scales, inspired by what we've done here on the, on the, the Brooklyn broadcast, and uh, go into depth on working through your minor pentatonic scales and I'm really happy with that course. I'm, I'm super psyched about this one. And then any other ideas that you have, I'm, I'm always open to what you'd like to hear from me. Um, what, I, what I probably won't, what I don't do when I can't do is like, here's a, here's a, a Jeff Beck note for note course or something like that for a bunch of reasons. One, there's the whole copyright issue. And two, um, I would have to work really hard to learn somebody else's stuff that well. So I can you know, fake things that I've learned on, on, from Jeff Beck and guys like that. But in terms of like note for note stuff, I, I, I can't do that. And I don't have the, I've never been really great at note for note. Some guys can do that. I don't have the mental energy <laughs> to commit to that kind of thing. You know, you know, it's so funny. Like all these people are on here now. It always get, fills up at the end here. I think because people get, their notifications differently. So we've got a lot of people online. So I'm happy to stick out for a little bit longer if you guys want to talk about some stuff. So people always love the gear. So I just want to talk about what's going on here. It's my Two Rock Bloomfield drive. And it is, like I said earlier, it's my my favorite amp that I've encountered from from them or almost anybody. Um, I have my, my Marshall, my old Super Lead, which I'm sitting in front of, but let me pull off to the side so you can see that um what is my chair stuck on something my cable so there's my old super lead it's a 1971 marshall super lead um that i got at uh carmine street guitars for 700 dollars i walked in and i'm like what what is that he's like oh it's a super lead and i'm like can we open it up and i Opened it up, and it's uh, the hand-wired one, and it had a lot of work done on it. A guy uh, in New York had modded it, Harry Colby, and some people really love those mods. I wanted it back to be more to spec, so I ran to the bank and pulled out more money than I had at the time and uh, bought it. And then um, I had a guy in New York City whose name is Matt Wells, who's the big uh, guitar repair guy. Oh, come here. Hey, psst, 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 come here. See if I can get Mr. Blackwell to come over here. He just, here, come here, kitty. He went, he disappeared for a week. Come here. Come here. Why don't you say hi? It's live. Come here. So, this is the cat that disappeared for a week and a half. So he's back. This is Mr. Blackwell. He is completely awesome in a typical cat fashion. Was like. So he's got, he got into a fight. So, he's all right, though. Here we go. So. Uh, all right, there you go. He's made his appearance. Um, okay, so, yeah, the Marshall Super Lead, I got really fortunate with that one. Though I had to drop a ton of money into it because it had to be rebuilt, um, which was a drag, but still less. Um, and now I feel like I've got one, and I'm very happy with uh, that amp. It sounds great. And um, so the Bloomfield Drive, right, uh, I love it. You know, it's sort of sort of dumbly but not entirely dumbly and it gets super rocking and um the great clean sound super punchy 
I really like it. I have the, the classic reverb signature as well. Uh, I love that amp. Uh, sounds great, especially with strats. Um, but in, in terms of it, um, in terms of, uh, for me, it's, it's the Bloomfield drive. And this is a 40-watt um, Bloomfield drive, which is crazy loud, especially for New York City and most any other gig that I do. 100 watt amp. The only time I found myself needing a 100 watt amp was when I was playing with Robin, and he would play his uh, his Dumble, which is a 100 watt. Now even Robin has uh, brought down the, vo the the wattage on a lot of gigs because he feels like he's just overpowered for a lot of rooms, and uh, I'd agree. <laughs> it's, it's the loudest I've ever playing in metal bands and everything like that. I've never played with a louder guitar player than him. And very clean and very, you know, playing at telly and it just bam, like it cuts through. It's awesome. It's the greatest guitar sound in the world. But I would, I needed something real loud to keep up with. So the 100 watt I was using there. So um, went for the 40 for New York City, uh, which is still plenty loud. And um, so yeah, I'm running through the Ox, giving that a shot. I find the aux is really cool. It's a bit, it's a bit tweaky. Nothing sounds exactly like to me, an amp plugged, you know, a mic amplifier. But can't quite do that here, in, freely in New York. I usually use the plugins, the Universal Audio plugins, when I'm teaching online, which I really like too, uh, as you guys have been listening to since the beginning. But I just said I plug this in because it's doing some recording. Yeah, so here's the gain channel. -y. If I hit the uh, the uh, bypass, and I can put the clon. Right. Yeah. So there's all sorts of great sounds, and I got a boost here on the floor. Uptown Blues just bought. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That is from uh, Will Rowe. Hey, David Keynes is joining in, right? Right at the end. All right, guys. Um, any quick questions before I go? I really appreciate everybody hanging here. Once again, go back to the beginning. I'm talking about playing using the open e open strings in a, in a E minor pentatonic scale on a blues, which is a ton of tunes, and it's a great thing to get into your vocabulary. Uh, Lightning Hopkins... Uh, Muddy Waters, um, John Lee Hooker, uh, Hendrix certainly, Voodoo Child, uh, both one and two. Uh, Hear my train a coming. Same thing, guys. You know, like you know, it's that like yeah, something like that. It's been a while. Right, that kind of thing. Um, World Keep Turning, A Well by Fleetwood Mac. That's all open E minor. Life on the Drop, Steve Ray Vaughan. The same kind of sounds. Uh, that's A minor pentatonic, but same kind of ideas. Um, like I said, but Lightning Hopkins, man. Especially those, there's just a collection, if you're not really familiar, just go Lightning Hopkins, Greatest Hits. The solo stuff I like the most. For somebody that he plays with the band, I, I prefer his solo stuff, like Baby Please Don't Go. Um, uh, man, and some of the, the, the greatest lyrics, com there's one that are you know, completely violent, misogynistic about shooting his girlfriend with a shotgun. And like, <laughs> you're like, whoa! Um, something you may even call like shotgun blues. But it, just the vibe and everything on those Leighton Hopkins recordings are so great. Um, all right, and once again, I know I'm repeating myself. Uh, you know, I get emails from people, from you guys, and people are just even saying it right here um, about that they look forward to this each week and how much fun they have. And uh, I, I want to say thank you. It really humbles me to hear that, and I really appreciate doing it. I really enjoy doing it. It makes all the craziness that's going on a lot more fun for me as well that we've built we're building this community a lot of the same names and people and just talking about guitar and having fun um because listen i mean i just talked for a half an hour about basically nothing right and we're just hanging out 
<laughs> so, I mean, how much fun is that? So I really enjoy it as well. Hey, Miguel. What's up, man? Um, so thank you once again, guys, and I will see you next week. And I'm going to have some fun announcements coming up uh, with uh, some other things on the World Wide Web as soon as they happen. And uh, we'll... Uh, See you guys later. Thanks again, Phil, Phil Mingan, the moderator extraordinaire. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.